next speaker is a uh, close friend and also founder of Select, uh, Devrat Shah from MIT. <coughs> Thank you. Um, uh, so those are perfect talks. Um, um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, not as what I do at MIT, but what uh, uh, we do at uh, uh, a company I founded a few years back, uh, uh, Select. So Select, when we started, actually we started with exactly the question that both Brad and Avinash raised, is that when people come to your store or people come to your website and then they buy something or they look at something, but they, what happened to the things that they didn't buy? Or what happened to the things that they browsed and uh, they decided not to uh, consume them? And there we, uh, we thought, okay, this is great. There is a signal that's left there. there is, these are the things that are on display and this is the things that I consumed, I purchased, I liked. So there's a comparison that you have communicated. And so then the question is that given this comparison as a signal, can you build uh, interesting mathematical models around it, build algorithms at scale, and then uh, derive signal out of it. And that was our view going in, and that was the, uh, I guess, uh, uh, at least at that time, naive optimism with which we started the company. And it was great because in the process, uh, I learned at least that uh, while I teach uh, machine learning to both undergrads and grads right now at MIT in the ECS department, I think some of the most interesting uh, frontier or goalpost for machine learning as we go forward are actually coming from retail. It's like um, almost one would feel, at least for me, getting five years back into this space, retail felt like the least sexy thing to do. Uh, but actually, it is uh, really, really fascinating. So what I want to do is that through this talk, again, it's a very overview-ish talk, so I won't go into the details of anything, but hopefully I will communicate uh, uh, some of the challenges that I see that are uh, out there front and center that have already been communicated in a spec by Brad and Avinash, and I'll just try to uh, put them in a specific context. So again, one way to think about machine learning or a popular buzzword now is AI. Uh, what would it do? Well, it would take the data and help us do decisions well. And if it's going to help us do that well, first let's make sure that we've got data in the right place. But over the uh, past couple of decades, we've got a variety of different software solutions, even though data might live in different silos. At least there are ways in which we can get them in one place. Uh, you want to understand what your data looks like. That's where the visualization uh, uh, revolution of last uh, decade. There are all sorts of visualization softwares available. But then the question is that what do you do with it? Well, what do you do with is first thing is what's going to happen next? That is, now that I have this data, what's going to happen next? What will be the demand of a product uh, tomorrow, next week, uh, next month? Once you understand that, the question is that, well, you want to use that insight to make a decision. And then the question is, uh, what do you do with it? And you've got lots of choices, whether uh, demand is going to go up, should you increase price? Demand is going to grow up, should you stock more? Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then once you figured out what to do with it, maybe you decided that you should increase price. Or maybe you decided that you should stock more. Which one was better? Again, this was type of question one was, uh, did it work? And once you figured out, well, here are the solution, here are the interventions effectively I put in place. Sometimes it works, sometimes it did not work, and question is, can I evaluate it? And there's just too many things going on, so is there a way for me to isolate it? Can I run experiments properly? Finally, once everything is put together, you just want to continue the loop. And this loop continues at different time scale, at different uh, uh, scale in terms of geography, and so on and so forth. All right, so when we think from our machine learning sense, and we are, when you're teaching in class, effectively you look at these three questions, and you say, well, the first question is nothing but uh, prediction problems. So these are the prediction problems in the most vanilla form. These are supervised learning questions. Or maybe your semi-supervised learning, few labeled and lots of unlabeled data. Or maybe actually the data has uh, unstructured information like images or text. So it's first is you want to extract features out of it and then use that for the purpose of prediction. So those are the type of questions you would ask for first task. Uh, if you're looking at the second task, really it's the decision-making systems or what uh, a, a good, um, uh, good formal way to think about, especially in the environment where I sit at MIT. Uh, some of my colleagues have done some amazing work at understanding macro decision processing and reinforcement learning. So these are the natural approaches. Uh, or when start thinking about just simple things like model predictive control, which is a classical uh, what control theorists have thought about forever, and so on. Or if you think about understanding effect of in 
interventions, it's the question of uh, causal inference. Like randomized control is, of course, the one thing to do, but many times in retail, we don't have opportunity to do randomized control, right? And I'll talk about that in a second. So maybe are there natural uh, experiments happening? What are the causality indices and so on? Again, so all of these three important things, uh, I think, come into play, and retail, I feel that in each one of them are at the forefront. Now, at Select, we've spent uh, time trying to address question here. So I'll spend uh, a good fraction of my time talking about this because I, a, I understand that well and I have something to say here. Uh, these are, however, really, really exciting challenge and I will briefly uh, point out a few things that I think uh, are uh, definitely worth thinking about there. And again, the, the, in fact, I will be e echoing some of the points that uh, two earlier talks uh, brought up. Okay, so with that, uh, just right, prediction is nothing but uh, uh, future of past is future of future, um, whether it's a forecasting or whether it's a missing values. Did I say it right? <laughs> yeah, I, I made sure that I rehearsed it so that I don't get in the wrong. <laughs> okay, future of past is future of last week is future of tomorrow. Good. Okay. <laughs> Um, now again, sort of everybody. Whenever everybody thinks about prediction, right, it's always about forecast, but it's not necessarily forecast because it could be just missing values. It could be static or it could be dynamic, and both aspects are important. And in the simplest form, you got some uh, signature, some observation, some features. Somehow you built a model and you got your target. And uh, if you were talking uh, a couple of decades back, maybe demographics are my features. I learned a linear regression model to determine what would be my life expectancy. Or if I'm thinking of dynamics here, then maybe I've got noisy locations and I built a beautiful Kalman filter or hidden Markov model and that will give me the location tracking uh, system. And fast forward it and then I've got lots of images and then I've got a beautiful neural network and that will tell me whether uh, it's a cat or not or whether this digit is five or dig this digit is six, okay? And these are all terrific things, and these are all great things. Uh, there's, of course, lots of uh, work that is along non-parametric uh, approaches and so on. The thing is that with all of these things, we're th thinking about setting where I've got lots of data. I mean, to train these kind of neural networks, I've got lots of images. Uh, retail is exactly the opposite. Uh, in retail, you've got extremely uh, sparse data problem. It's like, uh, this is like saying that I've got, um, billion coin tosses or million coin tosses and I've got, I've got to find bias of 10 coins. Retail is I've got million coin tosses and I've got to find bias of million coins. And so that's the, that's the challenge. Uh, putting it other way, uh, f one way to look at the prediction problem in retail is accurate demand forecasting. And by that, I mean that so you take a product, uh, you take a channel, you take a time interval and you tell me what is uh, what is the demand of this? If you can do that well, I think a good fraction of retail's, uh, f uh, retail's data science problem is solved. Okay. Now, of course, it's not as easy as I'm uh, saying. It's extremely hard, and that's the reason why this is a massive challenge. And one way to think about this is, again, going back to the point I made, is it's about uh, data is extremely sparse. There are two analogies I want to give just to make the, drive the point home. Um, one is, well, uh, this is a shirt that I bought at some point from some store. I don't remember where, but I bought it. Uh, this shirt in that store's uh, uh, or that retailer's uh, inventory would have a certain SKU number. This shirt might have been sold before that season, but would have, been, have a dif different SKU number just the way things work. Uh, so that means that the, the season it came out for sale, we had no, before it came out, we had no idea how many of them are going to sell. But what I did have information as a retailer is that, well, shirt like this were sold this much. Now, of course, if I did not uh, process its text and image and few other things, it would be very hard for me to figure out how the information or past transaction will give me any information. But maybe at the categorical level, I will say, okay, these many shirts sell or this many jeans. Okay? And that won't be accurate enough. So that's one way to think about why it's uh, uh, extremely sparse information and unstructured information like text and images can help. 
other way to look at it is, let's suppose we're still thinking of uh, selling gallons of milk, and so there's not really this kind of a problem. In that case, I've got, uh, again, the, while things are selling a lot, but you got one more thing, or you got, uh, as um, Avinash nicely said, so think of millions or hundreds of millions of customers depending on the type of retailer you are. And think of product uh, depending on the type of retailer you are. You're thinking of hun uh, hundreds of thousands to tens of millions to uh, hundreds of millions. Potentially, that's the number Walmart thinks about. Those many SKUs, and now I've got, uh, it's like an Excel file with so many columns and so many rows. And now look at, uh, think of this as a white sheet and put a black dot wherever for that row and that column, there's a transaction that has happened. Now put it on this sheet and it will look something like this. That's one way to say that it's really, really sparse. And the question is that how do you get around it? That's the, that, is a, that was a question and that was a uh, challenge. Well, there's only one solution. There's no, um, there is no, um, a magic wand here is somehow you got to stitch information together, uh, information together maybe through products to their unstructured information across time, across people, and across locations. And if you manage to stitch it well, hopefully there is a there is a way to do it. Now at Select, what we do is that we help retailers build uh, uh, solutions uh, for a variety of different things, in particular things like uh, buy optimization or assortment planning, um, uh, fulfillment. And there, when their, uh, their, um, um, their data is coming in, you can't, uh, you can't have a, a team of engineers, a team of data scientists restarting from scratch because that way we will never scale. Which means that one way or the other, you got to build um, a software, a software that can do this kind of things at scale in an automated manner. Tomorrow, uh, and with some retailer who has a Twitter feeds that come in and say, consume my that piece of information as well, well, you've got to have a soft software where you can sort of just feed in that extra feed of data and then hope that a prediction software will take care of it. Uh, one nice formalism for this kind of problem is uh, you can view the, your data as a, a higher order tensor. So just uh, here's a caricature of that, and this is as much as uh, 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 any formal stuff I'll talk about in this talk. So let's think of this one slice. And one slice, let's say here are people and here are products. And uh, this is information about transactions. Now the same people and same product, and if you have online blog, maybe there's a browse information. Maybe some more other things you have. Maybe there are uh, people whose demographic information is there, that's one more slice. Maybe there are products whose image and text information that there are different slices. And somehow what I want to do is I want to just fill in this slice. I don't care about other slices, but I want to use these other slices to put this together. Now if I view this as, um, uh, this as a tensor with uh, uh, lower dimensional latent representation, hopefully I can get something out of it. And that's effectively the software that we have built. And since this type of outcomes are consumed by people, people don't like to be told, right? They need to be explained. And so what we do is that we, for every prediction we make, we provide some form of provenance. One way to think about what sort of provenance looks like, well, I'm telling you that this shirt is going to sell 10 times because similar shirt like this last year sold nine times and there is an upward trend. So I thought that each layer is, as you said, product, people and products, and then the different layers are primarily location. What you're also saying is online could be time. So uh, again, so it's not just a, I'm, I'm drawing it as if it's a three, three order tensor, but you would think of it as a higher order tensor. Okay. All right, so there was a, uh, yes, yes, of course. Is one of your goals also to um, fill out the demand curve across price to enable? Good. Is that, is that kind of separate? Yes, yes. so. Pr pr price elasticity, again, so sort of that's extremely hard because especially with most retailer, what you have is at most two, and if you're really, really lucky, three price points, at least in our experience. Uh, so what helps, yes, so that is uh, an uh, important thing we want to do. One way you can uh, think about is why this kind of approach helps, and maybe we can get a little more technical later, is that here is a product like this that was sold at $50. I don't know how about it, but let's say $50. And here is another shirt, which is somewhat similar, not exactly same, but somewhat similar, which is sold at $45. And this shirt was sold at $50 in San Francisco, 
Uh, maybe in uh, now, I think, in new, uh, new Berkeley or New Oakland, which is uh, getting closer to San Francisco, the other shirt was sold at $45. And now I've got this natural experiment that just happened. Okay. And now I get a sort of a more data about products, uh, price uh, elasticity in a sense, than what I was doing before. And that is happening because I'm going across in some sense. Excellent point. And um, having, uh, it, it actually helps a lot. It's, um, it's remarkable that uh, how much it does. Okay. Uh, all right, so in maybe remaining three minutes, I'll very quickly uh, talk about two other things. And again, uh, as I mentioned, most of our time, at least at Select, we've spent building this software, and that's what we uh, commercialize, and that's what uh, we sell in even in now federal government. Uh, these are the very adjacent, extremely important questions, and I feel the, they need a lot of attention, and as uh, two of earlier speakers said, this is uh, extremely important. All right, so quickly, decision-making systems, uh, at any point of time, you, got, you made prior his, history of decisions, you got your state of the system, and you want to decide what is the next action you want to take, okay? And then continue repeating. Uh, so there's a classical way, and maybe there's a uh, modern ways to think about it. Again, here, uh, where you're thinking of training a Go, you've got <laughs> lots of data. Now, forget alpha goes zero for a second, because then the rules are very simple at the end of the day. But if you think about AlphaGo, then it was um, it's a lots of data that you had, and then you trained it. Now, you don't have this much amount of data, again, to train yourself in a uh, setting of retail. And also, the number of options here are few. The number of options that you have in retail are just uh, uh, infinite in some sense. Right? Uh, for example, uh, thinking from a life, uh, life cycle of a product, at some point, it's manufactured. So forget it's manufactured. For directly come to a retailer. Uh, at some point, you're deciding how much money you want to spend, where you want to spend. That's your first decision. Once you decided how, where you're, how much money you're going to spend, somebody has to decide what products to buy. Once you've decided what products to buy, you want to decide uh, where to uh, ship in terms of uh, uh, DCs. Once you have shipped in DCs, you want to decide uh, how do you allocate. It's a little shorter time scale. Once you have allocated, maybe it's not, uh, it's not uh, selling. Either you liquidate or you fulfill or you transfer. And then the cycle continues. And all of these decisions are happening at different time scales. And there are just too many options. That just makes it really hard. So I don't know even how to think about this in a holistic manner. Uh, the only hope is that even if we get something like simple uh, MPC working, I think that will be a huge success. And uh, one thing that we should never ignore in this world is that whatever MPC uh, solution or whatever solution comes out, humans are going to be involved in the loop. And you want to make sure that it human underst humans understand, accept, or work with that rather than not. And again, those things naturally came out in earlier uh, talks as well. So, and finally, in uh, coming to uh, causality, I think uh, this is this is an excellent thing that sort of uh, we came across uh, in all our uh, uh, helping with our all clients, where you know you say I'm going to change uh, how you allocate things in these three stores. Um, and then a, a quarter goes by, and they say, well, uh, we say, well, revenue went up. I said, look, this is because of us. He said, well, I don't know. Actually, your revenue went up because the economy became better. I said, no, 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 it was because of us. Or revenue went down. He said, no, no, it was not because of us. It was the economy went down. And so, so what do you do? Well, this is a classical situation where you can't do randomized control, or you don't have really, you're not studying the brain where there's a monkey is picking up and sort of your spike, uh, neuronal spikes are going up or down. Uh, you need, either you need something like natural experiments, just the way there's an uh, interesting thing going on in trying to say that, well, gender gap, sorry, uh, the gender wage gap is not because of the discrimination, but, but because of uh, women having, uh, women becoming mother. And that's a question, but uh, that's one way to, try to understand how we can do that in the retail context. Like a synthetic control seems like a natural thing to type to answer the type of uh, question I raised earlier. That is, is, here are three stores that I changed. Here are 10 other stores which almost look like these three representative stores. See what happened to them. Don't change any policies for them, but change policies for these. And then do control, and then sort of uh, try to answer that question. But again, that's just a one type of problem. There are many such things. Uh, so. 
uh, I feel it's almost like a CRISPR for genetics. Uh, CRISP, uh, if you know CRISPR, you can sort of actually go and uh, engine each, uh, uh, knock out each of the uh, DNA piece. Very nice, anyways. So I think it really is uh, amazing um, at an amazing stage. And uh, now that sort of data is coming, uh, getting in a much better way, uh, everybody's open about it. So if uh, I were to talk about uh, where are the next sets of goalposts for, uh, mach uh, for machine learning, I think retail is definitely a candidate. All right, so with that, let me stop. Thank you. Take a question or two while Andrew sets up. Yes. Who are your clients and what has their feedback been so far? Uh, feedback has been, of course, amazing. <laughs> uh, we are surviving and growing, more importantly. Uh, as far as clients are concerned, uh, uh, primarily retailers, but in the, in the retail uh, brands, like think of uh, Urban Outfitters, which is one of our clients. Uh, Urban Outfitters, and apologies, uh, free people. So that's that type of uh, retailers who are our primarily during the panel. But one thing I think is interesting is that you separated prediction, uh, decision-making, causality. But the reality is that the types of predictions you're making, I mean, one of the reasons the data is sparse is because you're trying to understand actions that haven't been taken yet, like prices or you know some of the other assortments or something. And if you did that, that effectively is causal inference because you want to understand the impact of the counterfactual. So, um, so yeah, it's interesting to think about where the lines blur between machine learning and then and then building the building like the decision making system you're talking about. Absolutely. We can talk about more later. Actually that's extremely important. Okay, great. Uh, last speaker is uh, Andrew Goldberg, um, and he's going to talk to us about production code efficiency. So take the Okay, so I'm going to from Amazon. Sorry, 